Welcome to MTG Evolving Wild. My name's Mark. I'm Cody. And I'm Ron. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the sets that came in between our kind of hiatus, kind of break, Commander Masters, and what that's kind of uh, done to... I don't know, good or bad, how it's how it's been making things maybe a little better, maybe a little worse for uh, different reasons. Making noise in the community. Making noise in the community for sure. So uh, it's mainly a reprint set. There were four commander decks printed with it. And in those commander decks, there were 10 completely new cards in each one for a total of 40 new reprints, or four, not reprints, 40 new cards. And then... About 450 reprints, if I'm not mistaken, in the actual uh, set that you could open up. Yep, Scryfall says 451. Scryfall says 451. Very cool. So um, I definitely think just with like having more reprints in general, that's always a good thing. Definitely one of the things I'm happier about with the set. Um, getting... Some of these cool cards that, like, literally there just aren't enough copies of. So, like, if you were to go to your local game store and be like, hey, do you have blank? This card? Yeah. It was almost always a, no, we don't. Yeah. Or (laughs) you'd have to look, like, you would see it because it's in the display case because they only have the one copy. (laughs) Yeah, and usually because that copy is so limited, that card is very expensive. One that... uh comes to mind for me that just got reprinted is steel shapers gift i think that one only had uh one printing before if i'm not mistaken and it was a while ago so it getting reprinted now is like kind of a really nice uh thing just another example would be like personal tutor oh yeah steel shapers gift was printed once at uncommon in fifth dawn and then finally got a reprint now, but it's been, you know, I mean, any 20 plus years going to be, yeah, sought after. Um, but yeah, I, what do you guys think about that? I think having actually like solid reprints in a set, which is something that I always like to see is like really exciting. Yeah, I mean, reprints are always a good thing. I'm just kind of looking at a list right now. You know, I'm seeing a lot of cards that I thought, wow, like I really want this in my particular deck, but this is a $20 card, $30 card or whatever, and now I don't want to get it. And I'm seeing a lot of these cards actually kind of come down in price now, and I'm thinking the same thing. More availability is better for the format as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean... You're seeing a lot of cards that were twenty dollars priced somewhere in like the eight dollar range, you know, or even cheaper in some cases, um, which honestly just does so much for the format and for you know the game of commander in general. I think the other really interesting thing is there are reprints that are, you know, kind of staples of other formats, even like uh What's the one I'm thinking of? Uh, Pure Steel Paladin. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's pretty uh, ubiquitous in modern Hammer Time decks. And that deck is still going to be very expensive, but... Just now it just became a little... Yeah, very yeah, slightly cheaper, maybe. So <laughs> in, in, instead of a $1,200 <laughs> investment in that modern deck, you're now looking at like... An eleven hundred dollar, yeah, huge difference. No, but uh, but you know, just to have more of these cards that are very important in a lot of different aspects, or maybe because of modern, the price goes up on these cards, and then they don't have a reprint, and then they're harder to get in Commander. It's just nice to see these cards get the reprints, and uh, you know, another one I've been thinking of is Perforos, which. Uh, Definitely, I wanted that in a lot of different decks. Oh, love me a Perfy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my my uh, Snake Wheels deck has been requesting that one for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's also, like, uh, you know, just all, the, the enemy Bond Lands. Like, I'm happy to see those. Those Anytime those get a reprint, I like to see that. I mean, to be fair, they honestly should be in, like, every Commander Precon, and I have no idea why they don't get reprinted more often, but, you know, Wizards does some weird things, Uh, like, look at Talisman of Progress, 
Mm-hmm. You know, there was a point where that was like a twelve dollar talisman. I think yeah, it was really high up there, twelve, fifteen dollars, and I was so annoyed because Azorius deck was one of the first decks that I've built, and I'm like, okay, when I'm picking up the staple pieces, why is this specific version for this specific deck a twelve dollar card? Whereas if I were playing any other color combination, I could get $2? the card for under five. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them were more expensive, like Rakdos, I believe, which is still like three or four dollars after getting reprinted. But still, that's wildly different than <laughs> progress. I than think we could. I think we could yeah. agree, though, that like the average talisman price is like two fifty, three bucks, something like that. I think Sometimes now it's cheaper. lower to around one to two is probably yeah. where you expect it. Because of yeah. all the pre cons that have been coming out as well, they they're fairly ubiquitous in those. Um, and really, Except for the stories ones, apparently <laughs> they're they're making a comeback. Now they're starting to put them in there slowly but surely. They've decided to end my torment. This is kind of random, but did you guys know that a dark car wastes is like closer to four dollars again? Really? Get out of town. I feel like I have a bunch of them from various like packs that I've pulled. I huh? What which card That's is it? the um the Azorius Painland. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm glad I picked those up. Apparently early. Azorius cards are where the investment is at. <laughs> what? Yes. I'm glad I hang, I hung on to that fetch land. <laughs> what, what's the uh, Azorius Bond land? Um that one is like, isn't it Sea of Clouds or something like that? That yeah, or, that one was reprinted in Baldur's Gate, and okay. that one's sitting at five, which is surprising. That one's like at around five dollars, yeah. And the Painland is at around four dollars. Yep, like, that that is clearly the way to go. Is that <laughs> you invest in the Azorius mana that's producers? Right. <laughs> Everybody loves Azorius. <laughs> no, but, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely do not. Um, the I only do. reason. I, I knew about a dark car waste is because I'm making a five color deck and that's one of the lands that I have to put in it and I'm like oh this land is more expensive than I thought why is that an expensive card it shouldn't be it should be reprinted in every commander deck do you, do you need one because no. I'm pretty sure I have it I, I only have one again five color deck so the only place I'm ever going to need anything Azorius is in that deck and nowhere else <laughs> ever yeah, Mark is very much an Azorius player, totally. Definitely, definitely. I mean, really, it's just an aversion to blue with Mark. I, I think he has, what, one of 13 decks that has blue in it? And, and uh, even then, it only two. has blue because it's five color. No, 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 no. no, no. I have one five color deck and one Grixis, Grixis de- deck. Right. Yeah, and the Grixis yeah. deck no one lets him play ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when we give Mark blue. Yeah, that's what happens when I get blue. No one wants me to play. No, but I... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I've noticed that a little bit about myself. That I, I, especially with Azorius, I, I like to keep the game moving, not keep the game stopping. So. Well, Azorius doesn't necessarily stop the game. It just uh, gives you more resources to make sure it goes in the direction that you want it to. You, you could always play like Yu Yu Hakusho Spirit Tribal. Sure, yeah, you can play Spirit Tribal, and there are a lot of gr- more group huggy Azorius options as well that do increase the speed of the game, like Quain. Oh, I did just play. take it apart, so I do have an etched foil <laughs> version. I'm not, I'm not making Azorius deck, guys. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah so a lot of good reprints. A lot of good reprints. Um, again, a lot of the prices on the reprints themselves uh, are going down, so uh, that's what I like to see. I like to see the... Um, you know, just the cards that are being printed in the in the new set being cards that people want. There's a lot of, uh, you know, everything from the free commander spell cycle thing to uh, uh, medallions was a huge one. Like, love the medallions. Yep. If if wizards is gonna crack down on proxies, then uh, you know, getting getting more access to just these cards in existence, I think is a nudge in the right direction for sure um but wizards doesn't look at the secondary market so (laughs) no no not at all oh my god yeah they they (laughs) definitely don't do that um but yeah so with this set there's obviously one really uh obvious negative and that is the price for packs and and getting sealed product and as a result uh that changes a lot of how the rest of the cards are priced 
Yeah, you know, listen, this set has pros and cons, and as good as the reprints are and as fun as the draft might be, which I've heard it's very fun, by the way, not many people are going to get to see or access all these cool new cards when the price is so limiting for so many people. I mean, the, the pack prices are much more expensive than what we've seen in the past. It's outrageous, and really, there's no way for you to break even on packs or boxes um unless you're pulling the absolute top chase cards in the set which let's be honest here you're probably not (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's a lottery i've seen some very interesting shifts going on with the price with this set when it first uh like before the set came out like early pre-release time the box prices were sky high and the singles were all at pre-sale ridiculously low. Like stuff like the green medallion being around $4. Wow. And, uh, you know, like just uh, a bunch of cards, uh, even at lower prices than they are now that the set is released. But the box prices were, you know, like something like $300 for a draft booster box and then up from there. What I've seen happen after the set has come out is the prices of the boxes have started going down so draft boxes are maybe closer to 250 than 300 um and set and collectors have somewhat followed suit but the cards the single cards in the set have started to go back up in price which is definitely something i don't want to see um yeah i mean that i think is just a product of you know no one opening the boxes is what brought the uh, single prices back up to you know like a higher price point you know like ten dollars for the medal the green medallion um you know is no one's opening the boxes so these rares that are in these packs are just sitting there and you know the fact that the prices on the sealed product is coming down just tells me that like wizards just screwed over every lgs who was forced to buy at this premium price and is now trying to just unload what they have to break even at best yeah yeah it really does feel like a product of greed at the end of the day and truly i mean it's unfortunate because when you were talking about the pre-sale prices that you were noticing, it's very much like that's the potential of what we could have seen if the box prices were somewhat reasonable. Listen, like more than $200 for a draft box, that's incredibly expensive. So in theory, you know, while the cards are good, they're not that level of good. For every great rare reprint you can get, you can get another Zetel you can get another Talrand and it, it really it's just such a hard gamble for that price and and really um it's so prohibitive and but we saw what it could have looked like uh, if the prices were reasonable that is that is really sad because I, I hope that there is a way or or that things end up panning out to where a lot of these reprints can go back down in price over time without them you know needing to be necessarily reprinted in every single set moving forward but like, you know, there was that moment in the pre-sale where I'm like, oh my God, is this is this the price? Is this what it's going to be like? And I just was like, not buying anything because I'm like, what if it goes lower or whatever? But yeah. but yeah, then um, because everything's so outrageously overpriced, like yeah, if the you know people buying magic cards are buying it at the price that stores are you know needing to sell them for on release day um they're getting screwed because the value of the cards in the pack is dropping and they're uh you know most of the time not going to get the rares or mythics or even uncommons that they want and uh if they happen to be able to get a store to sell it for them for to or sell it to them for cheaper then the store is kind of getting hosed because they bought it at certain prices and uh, to make a profit on it, need to, you know, sell it for a certain amount. And if it's not selling for that amount, they're not making a profit on it. And then it's it's unfortunate because if, if Wizards 
you know, really wanted to do something good for LGSs and for the community as a whole, I feel like they would have released them at, at lower distribution prices and whatnot and then made it so that it was more affordable for both uh, stores and for consumers. So I, I want to backtrack a little bit because, I mean, like some of the pricing isn't like, the most outrageous you know like if we f- figure this to be a premium product you know um i want to say that i paid like 220 for a draft box of dominaria remastered which only came in draft and collector's boxes um you know and i absolutely did not get m- my value back from the draft box but I had fun pulling packs, you know, it, you know, it was at least a relatively reasonable price. And then I think I paid like 300 for the collector's box, which was much better pulls. But I also had, I think, 10 boosters in the collector's box versus the, what is it, four in the Commander Masters? Oh, yeah. The collector boxes are un- unbelievable. Like, yeah. to, you know what? Um while Domino Remastered is an interesting comparison to make, I, I kind of find the comparison to be a lot closer to Double Masters 2022. Same, same concept. It's, um, you know, well, a premium those, set that it has a draft and it has a collector's. Those um, collect the Double Masters 2022 collector's boxes also had the four pack instead of like the 12 pack that usually comes with collectors. But, um, I I have been trying to think back because I remember thinking when Double Masters 2022 came out, like it felt like a very home run set, like a very like, this is awesome set, but maybe it was just like the higher reprint value in that set. Maybe it was just because we saw Baldur's Gate right before that and everyone was like, what the heck is this? Like, (laughs) you know, they should have just like made this Double Masters, but, um, you know, I, I it seems that Commander Masters, from what initial prices of boxes were and stuff like that, I could be wrong, but it appeared as though those were, like the draft boxes of Commander Masters were more expensive than the draft boxes of Double Masters 2022. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, same goes for the collector boxes. But, um, you know, with the if they're more expensive than that and that, you know, that was a good set, but I think that was kind of the price point that people are willing to maybe pay to, to get a good box. And there was a lot of excitement around it. And now I think maybe it's happened too many times, or maybe the price has just pushed too high that consumers, a lot of people I've talked to have started to become really negative about wizards as a whole. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I've been noticing this trend for a long time. You know, it seems as if uh, ever since the game really blew up uh, around the pandemic, it, it kind of went from, oh, great, like, how can we grow the game to more of a mindset of like, all right, how can we squeeze every cent out of our paying customers that we possibly can? How can we give them less for more? And, and, and maybe I'm not exactly right in that sentiment because we are still getting good cards, more access to more things. And I'd say... I I would probably have been better off getting into the game now than a few years ago in terms of pricing for all the availability in cards. But, you know, I, I'm still noticing almost an attitude direct shift. You know, the, the sort of this product is not for you sort of attitude that Wizards is kind of carrying. Like, and, and really, Magic 30th Edition was one thing that really made a lot of people realize, like, wait, like, they're for real? They're actually kind of going in this direction? And now, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing them... Because of partially like the success of secret layers where they realize, okay, we can sell four cards for $30 and we can sell like dumb cards that nobody cares about if we put a cool art on it. I feel like they're, they're kind of taking advantage of that in the same token. So I want to double back to the double masters thing a little bit. I think there's a little bit of an exception on that too, because in double masters packs you get two rares just so you know you get at least two rares in draft packs of commander masters as well oh is that the yeah 
Oh, okay. I, I did not know that. Um, it does make it feel a little better, but I, I mean, like the price is still, you know, like almost uh, like uh, one and a half times more expensive for the box. I think what it kind of comes down to is like, because because I'm trying to now that I'm really reflecting on it, Double Masters 2022 and Commander Masters. Uh, seem to be very similar products with very similar like setups as far as the draft boxes and collector boxes go. Um, but, you know, maybe it's that they've pulled this stunt too many times. Maybe it's that, you know, the, these prices are starting to become like more regular and they're like, well, let's see how much we can push this setup and maybe see if we can push the price up on this. It does start to feel like you know, they've taken this amazing thing, which is the amazing growth of their game and are turning it into, uh, I mean, a money-making machine, of course, because that's what the ultimate... <laughs> we live in a society. Right, we live in a society. But they could be not pushing it down that route so much. But as, you know, if they're just pushing profits as the number one goal, that's going to start to take a toll on people's uh view of the game uh, as a whole you know truthfully i feel like this has a lot to do with hasbro essentially having a failing business model whereas watsi is the like soul shining property that they like own and is the only thing that is generating profits for them and now they're like putting the pressure from above to say like okay well you guys need to make us more money because we're failing at everything else that we're doing <laughs> yeah, no, nobody wants to buy gi joe's anymore i guess <laughs> rip gi joe rip monopoly Secret Lair, Universes Beyond, G.I. Joe. <laughs> Let's see it. I'll see it when I believe it. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Let's see it. Um, another, uh, you know, interesting thing is uh, just that with kind of this potential buildup, like if a competitor came in, like, I mean, I know we're all thinking about Lorcana, Disney's new card game, and offered more reasonable prices or or a similar gameplay experience that's more obtainable um you know is is that going to start taking customers away from wizards of the coast because they're just continuing to charge as much as they want for things um possibly very much so with uh, magic the gathering is a very enfranchised game and the people who do play it tend to be enfranchised players but uh, you know as someone who kind of got into it around the pandemic a few years ago yeah i've built up a collection and i have a lot of ties to the game that i wouldn't want to just like you know sell all my stuff on a whim and play a new game right off the bat it's looking more and more attractive each day i i feel I think with the, like, you're not going to see the same whales being whales for Lorcana as they would for Magic, I feel like. Um, but what you'll see, I think, is the people who, you know, are getting priced out of sets because this product is not for you, um, you know, making a switch over if Lorcana is able to keep a steady, reasonable price. And the people who also enjoy, like, Universes Beyond, um, you know, Disney can just crush those, uh, like, un any Universes Beyond that Watsy can bring in for the most part. Oh, yeah. Like, we're talking Marvel, Star Wars, um, like, I mean, any of the Disney stuff, like, and the, the Disney stands just go crazy for Disney stuff, too. Like, they're going to wail this product so hard. Oh, for real. And even then, like, think about what Disney has access to that's outside of their own IPs as well. They probably won't want to go there, but if they really wanted to, just to really give Magic the Gathering the middle finger they could probably get access to way more rights than Hasbro can just yeah. in general. They could probably go down a similar route eventually and pick up, you know, maybe even secret former secret layers that have done things with Magic the Gathering. Like yeah, it's possible. Lord of sure. the Rings? Yeah, why yeah. not? <laughs> um the Tolkien estate comes out on top. Yeah, they're <laughs> cool with that. <laughs> We're playing both sides. <laughs> um but like I think uh, 
it's exciting to me too to kind for me too to kind of have like you know magic is a game that was created in the early 90s and some of these cards there's not a chance that I'll ever be able to like own a real black lotus and play with that real black lotus in any setting ever most likely i could get lucky and find one in a garage one day but like a dual land a dual land even sure like gotta gotta drop a couple hundred just to get one of those almost a thousand for i think a tropical island yeah or it's a volcanic one of the two depending on if you're going from alpha beta or unlimited yeah it could be a lot of money Whereas, you know, right now, if there's a game, like, if Lorcana ends up releasing and it's incredibly fun to play, and you can get your hands on the first set right now, even if it's, you know, going to be a little pricier because there's a lot of Disney fans buying it, it's not going to be an Alpha Booster pack. It's going to be way cheaper than an Alpha Booster pack, you know? I don't Different even, context, of course. I don't even know that it's going to be more expensive because Disney, like, the one thing I will say about Disney, having, you know, like, been a Disney person for a while, is their pricing is very consistent. You know, like, every now and again, you'll see, like, some Disney products that have, like, surge pricing, you know, because of demand. But for the most part, there's supply available and it is very set for like this is what they're selling it at you know so like you won't see these fluctuating boxes of like okay it's 125 for a draft booster box versus like 250 for a draft booster box because oh this is a premium set no this is going to be 125 like in perpetuity basically Mm mm-hmm if they can, you know, kind of keep the price fairly leveled and and make a healthier marketplace for people to get cards, get packs and have fun with the game and not have to spend a fortune, you know, get competitive decks and not have to drop a thousand dollars like that could be a very, you know, fun game to maybe try for sure, potentially just see like, you know, if again, I I'm almost hoping that it kind of kicks magic into gear a little bit just to be like, oh, or or maybe Hasbro can see like, oh, okay, we can't just keep milking this because someone else will come in and do it for cheaper and still make a profit and just have a more loyal audience. Right. Like at the end of the day, you know, we live in a capitalistic society and right now I feel like Wizards of the Coast has kind of had a monopoly on trading card games. Sure, there's Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, but most Pokemon card collectors are just that, collectors. And Yu-Gi-Oh, like there's a few fans, but uh, I don't know. I, I know way more uh, Magic the Gathering players than I do know Yu-Gi-Oh players. And, and, and sure, that's partially because of my own biases. But in general, if you go to many local game stores in our area, um, they're going to sell both Yu-Gi-Oh and Magic. But typically, I, I feel like they focus more on Magic than they do on Yu-Gi-Oh because I feel like there are, just simply put, more players. And because of that, that magic kind of has a monopoly on the trading card scene because you know sure there are other options but you know you aren't gonna find as many players to play vampire the masquerade or or what's that card what's that card game for vampires something uh, i think it's something like that maybe i got yeah. it but yeah you know there aren't as many players but they, they exist but you know really i i think another mainstream card game might you know, give Wizards that competition that, honestly, it needs. Uh, Otherwise, the monopoly is just going to get worse and worse, and people are going to pay more and more until they say, you know what? Screw it. We're kind of done. Yeah. I I mean, I think the marketplace is seeing some of that, though, because, like, there's now Flesh and Blood, which is a growing base. And, I mean, like, a lot of them are still young and haven't had 30 years to develop a player base and a, like, brand recognition that Magic has. But, you know, like, Flesh and Blood is a big one uh, that's coming up. Uh, I'm seeing a lot more One Piece stuff, honestly, online. Like, yeah, and One Piece is supposed to be a really fun game. Like, I would be interested in trying that out. Um, you know, even if you're not a fan of like the anime, you know, which I think might be the only thing that hurts it a little bit. But 
It does, but to be fair, like I'm not an anime guy at all, and One Piece is probably like the one show that I'm like, okay, this is pretty dope. <laughs> I still haven't watched any One Piece, but yeah, I, I can imagine with over a thousand episodes, they probably have a lot of uh, cards they can, card designs they can make from all of those like episodes. I'm sure there's like, yeah, you know, some random little Easter egg callback to some five second clip that people will be <laughs> like, oh my god, that was my well, favorite I, part. I feel like even just the general principles of the show kind of could lay out a good foundation for the game. Again, I've never played the game, so I'm probably not knowing absolute crap, and I'm also only like, you know, a hundred and something episodes into the show. But, um, you know, the devil fruit concept, the whole kind of concept that you can eat this magical fruit and kind of get powers, is probably something that you could work with uh, to explain some of the crazier things you can do and some of the, uh, it explains some of the cooler characters and stuff, but I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of like kind of laws about the world and, and like certain fruits and, and, and stuff like that that could probably apply to the game. But, so, yeah. Yeah. Kind of to tie things back, I think this is the biggest con that comes with, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> Commander Masters is that we're sitting here talking about other trading card games right now because they might also be fun and be at a price point where we can more easily buy into them or, or you know, get the cards that we want for them. Whereas, you know, with this product releasing at such a high price you know new players definitely aren't inclined to i mean maybe i, I would imagine new players aren't inclined to spend 300 dollars on a box or more potentially considering that they're probably not going to use 80 percent of the cards that uh they pull in general uh you know like every or like general deck building and things like that um yeah. You know, I, I think that's a fair assessment. So, like, it's just, it's not really worth it for us either to buy a box of it. We've been playing for a few years now, and, um, you know, we're kind of like, oh, like, you know, maybe if we find singles at a place somewhere where they've opened a box, it might be worth picking them up. But none of us are, like, you know, running to the to the store to buy a box or, like, the pre-orders aren't running out on the product, you know? Like, yeah, and, and truly, I mean, I've said I've said the word capitalist and capitalism a lot this episode, but truly, you know, in our society, we vote with our wallets, and I don't want to give Wizards my blessing on this product, so I'm not buying it for that reason. It's simply put, again, I want some of the cards in there. I don't even think that opening a draft pack would be a horrible experience for me. But I don't think it's a business model I support, and I think that Wizards can do a whole lot better for the game and for itself, so I'm not buying anything. I mean, who is this set for? It, you know, it's not for new players. It's not for people who are passionate about the game and, like, reasonably entrenched in the community. Because it's not might, for they, you. They probably have, like, people who... who are entrenched in the game probably have a lot of the cards that are being reprinted which is kind of another funny thought like right like we, i mean we yeah we probably bought in at a higher price point sure but we already have them mm -hmm. yeah nobody needs a fifth copy of talrander's atalpa <laughs> <laughs> so i mean are they really just chasing that you know three percent of the player base who buys every single product and wants all of the you know, alternate arts and, you know, everything like I, I think is, so. is that what is that what the game is coming to? Is that screw everyone else? And this is, you know, who we're chasing it's it wizards like, and the whales. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we move to our final thoughts, I wanted to bring up another con. Um, <laughs> so the three of us will be attending Magic Con Las Vegas and that's going to be taking place near the end of September. The uh, 22nd through the 24th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe that's right. Um, if any of you guys listening are going to that already and want to come meet up with us, we might have some special gifts to, to give out. Um, but yeah, even if you just want to come up and say hi, uh, we'll try to make it clear based on potential shirts that we're wearing that we're, uh, <laughs> we're in this podcast. So 
take a look for us, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> come say hi, meet us. Maybe we'll play a couple of games of Magic if you're cool. And uh... <laughs> Yes, no Azorius players, please. Yeah, only for me. <laughs> <laughs> only Azorius players at this pod. <laughs> no! <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so moving on to our final thoughts about this set. Um, are either of you guys planning on buying anything related to this set? And if so, why or why not? And what would you buy? Um, maybe some singles, uh, depending on where the price ends up, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like we're past the point where, you know, singles reach their lowest point from a new, uh, set typically, so it's just going to be where they end up. And at that point, you know, like, not really. I'm, I have zero interest in opening any packs from this set or anything like that. I don't think I'd open up a pack if I found a bajillion packages of it in a dumpster somewhere like other people have for other boxes. Um, <laughs> what would I mean, you do with the packs if you found them in a dumpster somewhere? Honestly, probably just sell them. <laughs> it, oh, it, oh that, 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 that might be the way to go. But I was going to say, yeah. That, that, <laughs> yeah, at, at this point, because what? I can either sell them and then get like hundreds of dollars or I can open them and then maybe get like a hundred dollars off of my bowls. You know, it doesn't. I mean, if the, it's like a pallet of boxes that you found in the dumpster, <laughs> may, maybe you do open the, all of them, and okay, then you could sure. I would be swimming so, so in that's the cards. I'm, I'm only going to open this set if I find it in in a pallet, nicely sealed in a dumpster somewhere. We should go dumpster diving, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, this this wow. We would re- literally rather go dumpster diving than buy this set. Yeah, uh, that oh that that sounds about right for where I'm at. Yeah, maybe some singles. Like I'm not going to lie. When we were uh, recording this episode, I was kind of looking up some of the cards that were getting reprinted for my own reference. I'm like, okay, there are some pretty low prices on some cards that I do really want. So maybe some singles, but uh, no, I'm not opening any sealed to this set. I've, uh, I've made the decision to, <laughs> <laughs> to already buy a couple packs of this set. And, um, you know, I got it for a decently reasonable price from a store I really like, so I didn't mind just spending the money there. Shout out Collector's Paradise. Woo. But um, I learned my lesson real fast because <laughs> I opened both packs and definitely did not get what I paid for them in terms of card value. Or I might have just barely broken even if we're counting every common and uncommon i pulled you did get that foil deadly relic that was the one thing like in the last slot of the second pack i was uh opening the pack and i was like all right dud rare dud rare oh foil oh it's a rare oh it's deadly relic so (laughs) that that was very lucky but i realized that i got really lucky with that pack and that you know, after that pack opening experience, sure, it was a lot of fun, uh, but there's a lot of cards from the set I obviously didn't get, and that's what the experience of opening a lot of these packs are going to be. So I'm now more in the boat of, like, I would much rather get a, you know, uh, singles from the set, or, you know, if these set packs really never come off shelves and they start to go down in price even more i could see myself maybe picking up a few more packs like that but i don't think i would go in for like a whole box or anything if a set box drops to 150 i could see myself buying a the set box at that price okay i I would like to but then i know i'm screwing some local game store over if i if that's the case i mean i hope it doesn't get to that i mean some cost fallacy like they've already spent the money and like at this point, they're probably just hoping that someone will come in and pick up the box and get it off their hands so that they can put new product on so, the shelves. Yeah, at at that point, if a store I like is selling it for a reasonable price, if it's down to one fifty, like that's almost like the money's falling out of my wallet at that point. Like, <laughs> but but yeah, like I I don't anticipate that being the case. Like I I really feel like uh, most likely what's going to happen is like you know, probably 
things are going to stay similarly to how they are. Honestly, oh, I mean, worst set. case scenario, what I see is a shop opening up whatever remaining stock they have of the product, and then they'll just put them in their, you know, binders oh. or where, wherever they have their singles. That's best that's, case scenario. That's for probably me. what they really like that. have to do yeah. at, at a certain point. Well, any other final thoughts about Commander Masters, guys? Uh, yeah, do better, Wizards. But no, good, good, good track. I like the direction, but come on, guys. It's cardboard. How much come you have on. to charge it? Come on, <laughs> guys. It's cardboard. It's cardboard. Some of them are shiny. So what? <laughs> also, fix the foil issue that you have with your cards. Oh, All, does, like, does, this set, does this set still Pringle? I have no idea. Bad. Okay. I mean, I double sleeved my foil real quick. I didn't even give it the chance. I mean, sure, as we should. I mean, there's also a lot of etched foils which don't have that problem. Uh-huh. But, uh huh. But those ones tend to look like dark and grainy sometimes. Yeah. But I, I mean, like again, like etched foils, I've never seen Pringle. But you know, like a standard foil, yeah, that thing will fold in half. Like, I, I'm surprised I don't see crease marks from how hard it's folding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that's our. Uh, I guess that's my final thoughts. Uh, yeah. I, I uh, can say it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Do better, wizards. Uh, good try at a set, but it's too expensive. And I think these cards need to be more accessible for people who want to play Magic. Maybe bring back MSRP. Maybe. Come on, it's Godboy. Yeah, but just don't bring it up at like four hundred dollars a box, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, also that. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, to talking to you guys again soon in our next episode. Uh, make sure to check us out on our socials, uh, MTG Evolving Wild. Uh, on everywhere. Everywhere, pretty much. <laughs> Email us at mtgevolvingwild at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye-bye.